beep. Hello and welcome to the April Wednesday webinar from the IEA King Cole Center. My name is Benedict Brox and I'm the communications officer here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, www.iea-cold.org. Residents of member countries and employees of our sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration. Please visit our website for details. The subject for today's webinar is Economic and Strategic Value of Coal, presented by Paul Barua. Here you go, Paul. Thank you, Benedicta, and uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so, yeah, as she said, I'll be uh, talking to you for the next half hour or so about the economic and strategic value of coal activities uh, from mining and power generation. When one reads news and energy journals, it appears that all news tends to cover the negative impacts of coal, but a lot less is reported about the positive feedback associated uh, with coal-related activities. Um, in advanced economies, it's proven to be a valuable backup fuel, especially in times of electricity supply stress, and we'll have a few slides uh, a bit little later to show that. While elsewhere, coal is an affordable, stable source of electricity and is, one of the, is the number one choice for baseload power in many industrializing countries. Worldwide, the strategic value of coal is quite significant. The world uses roughly 7,000 million tons every year, most of that in Asia, and particularly in some of the most dynamic economies. Um, and uh, this webinar examines the value of um, the coal uh, and related activities and accompanies a report, a draft report, um, which will be due out sometime in the uh, early summer. Now in this webinar, I've selected a few major issues that are in the report. And firstly, we will briefly look at the econometric link between energy consumption and economic growth. Uh, then I'll introduce some of the basic concepts that economists look at when assessing the value of an economic sector like mining and power generation industries. I'll present an example of how economists evaluate economic value using the Queensland coal mining sector. And I'll also show an example of how fossil fuels have proven to be an invaluable backup for gas and renewables uh, during extreme winters in the United States. And uh, we'll finally end on some of the um, ideas uh, we've discussed. Now, sustainable economic growth <clears throat> has been identified as one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And with half of the world living on an income of just $2 per day, employment itself does not always guarantee prosperity in all households, but improving opportunities to provide good quality employment with well-paid jobs and skills requires the provision of reliable and modern energy services. Unfortunately, the development of such services is uneven across the world, and target growth rates still remain below par below the 7% target of uh, GDP growth. <clears throat> Pardon me. Analysis of the relationship between primary energy consumption and economic development has found a, a so-called unidirectional causality between energy consumption and gross domestic product. Uh, so basically, it means that one drives the other uh, factor. Strong evidence for China in the period 1990 to 2009 supports this analysis. And other research suggests that a single percentage point, for instance, increase in the consumption of oil products can boost economic growth by 1.1% in, in many countries. Similarly, the supply of affordable and reliable electricity and the link with economic growth has been shown in countries worldwide across all sizes of economies. For example, the USA, China, New Zealand, uh, Malaysia, uh, so on and so forth in this list where the linkage between the use or the cost of electricity can affect economic output. For example, in the USA, research has shown that regions with more energy intensive industries are much more likely to feel the negative effects of rising energy prices, uh, resulting in a decrease in industrial output, depending on how energy intensive uh, those sectors are. <clears throat> In 2012, the World Bank reported that each additional unit of electricity supply to an economy uh, was a key driver for a rise in employment, particularly in industrializing countries. 
And so this is another example of a study linking the unidirectional causality um, of one factor such as electricity supply and another factor, in this case, job creation. However, where an economy has shifted heavily towards the service sector jobs, of course, less electricity is required for the same level of economic output. So it really depends on the level of um, development and advancement of any particular economy at any time. Now, let's look at an example of the economic value of uh, the coal mining sector uh, in a strong mining region, in this case, Queensland, Australia. Before we do that, a quick introduction to Australian mining. In 2017, the country produced 500 million tonnes of coal in a highly mechanised and productive coal mining industry. Roughly 311 million tonnes was uh, thermal coal and 190 million tonnes was metallurgical coal. Australia is the world's leading exporter of hard coal, trading roughly 300 million tonnes of coal with the rest of the world, mainly uh, its trade, with its trading partners in Asia. Queensland accounted for almost half the nation's production, operating a mix of open cast and deep underground mines. The coal export business is a major earner of foreign currency and contributes a massive proportion of the region's economy. In addition, hard coal contributes to more than 70% of Queensland's electricity. Now, if we just focus on the coal mining sector, this is what we come up with. Um, this very uh, pretty poster was published last year by the Queensland Minerals Council, providing data on wages, employment, business spending, and royalties received by the Queensland government from uh, the coal mining activity in the year 2016 to 2017. Now, on the left-hand side of this slide, we see the impacts created directly by the coal mining sector itself. It generated $2.7 billion uh, Australian dollars of wages uh, paid to 21,218 employees, all full-time positions directly employed in the mining sector. Some 11.2 billion Australian dollars was spent on goods and services uh, that benefited um, 8,577 local businesses. 460 community-led organizations also benefited and coal mining generated $3.4 billion of royalties to pay for essential social, education, and health spending in the state. If we move to the right-hand side of the poster, or rather towards the middle of the slide, uh, we see that local spending and direct employee spending led to the creation of a further 169,000 employees, adding a further $20.5 billion Australian dollars in value. In total, $37.8 billion of gross regional products uh, and almost 190,000 employees was created from coal mining in Queensland. So this is an excellent example of a thorough and in-depth analysis of the value of coal mining in the region, and the accompanying report has several more examples of such analyses around the world. In summary, this type of analyses, economic, economic analyses, and looking at the uh, value of any economic sector can be summarized into the uh, following three major categories, and these are categories that are used widely uh, by most economists. These are direct impacts, which include the employees, the incomes earned by employees, the royalties that are paid to local, regional, and national governments. There are indirect impacts, uh, which covers the expenditure of, say, a mining company, which creates cash flow and income to service and supply companies that are affiliated and dealing with that mining company, and thus, in turn, creates a second tier of incomes and employment. There's a third set of impacts uh, called induced consumption, where household consumer spending created by mining employment creates incomes on the high streets and other businesses um, in, uh, in the general national regional communities. So we've mentioned that the value of coal in Australia lies in two markets. Firstly, as an ex export commodity, and secondly, as a source of electricity. In either case, Queensland is one of the most efficient and modern mining industries in the world. However, being export-led, the industry is also at risk of price changes due to the daily risks associated with world commodity markets. But it's not always a bad thing. Since 2015, the doubling of world's coal prices helped the state of Queensland boost its cash flow into the mining sector, which further boosted royalties and a much-needed cash injection into the public sector. The state earned a windfall of an extra one billion Australian dollars in public funding receipts due to those royalties from the mining sector in just one year, in just 2018. In New South Wales, the state government received a similar amount, uh, although uh, the figures refer to 2013 to 2014, um, showing that the state received 1.4 billion Australian dollars uh, from royalties. 
However, a subsequent reduction in coal production um, in New South Wales led to a negative impact on the gross state product for that state, uh, compared to other mining sectors at least, such as metal ores and other minerals. And the total impact was uh, led to a $200 million loss in gross state product for every $100 million of devaluation in the coal market, whether it be a reduction in production or a fall in prices. In China, coal provides roughly two-thirds of the nation's primary energy supply and the same proportion of electricity generation. Cumulative coal production since 2000 to 2017 has amounted to an output of 47 gigatons, generating roughly 22 trillion yuan of revenue, uh, equivalent to roughly $2.2 trillion over eight years. Uh, other financial data, however, shows that an estimated $5.8 billion of subsidies were awarded to the coal industry um, in, a, in a single year. However, the business income tax that was generated was uh, $9.6 billion. Uh, US dollars of revenue, which more than compensates for the 5.6 billion awarded in subsidies and aid. In employment terms, the coal mining sector in China and downstream activities employ some 5.8 million people. This colossal level of employment comes even after a long period of restructuring in the mining sector. However, by 2020, further rationalization of the coal mines could change the industry again, leading to 2.3 million miners possibly seeking re-employment in other sectors over the coming years. Turning to coal power in China, a further three to four million people are employed in the power utility sector, uh, and coal's contribution to the Chinese economy is almost immeasurable as it underpins and facilitates almost all of the economic activity, uh, particularly in the industrial and manufacturing as well as commercial sectors and households. It provides a majority of the electricity in the country, and uh, research has shown that if China were to switch its coal power fleet to gas plants overnight, the change in the operational fuel costs alone to the economy would be the equivalent of a tax increase of 171 billion US dollars uh, every year uh, based on 2014 gas prices alone. In South Africa, let's move on to a different continent now. Uh, South Africa is a middle income economy with a per capita gross national income of just 5,430 US dollars. Uh, per person for figures uh, in 2017. Um, if you compare that to the GNI per capita in the UK of $41,000 and the USA, which is close to $58,000, um, it can, gives you a sense of scale of the um, income levels in uh, households in South Africa. Half the country's population lives below the poverty line, and unemployment runs at 27%. So providing a secure supply of reliable electricity has become a rather compelling objective for the country, as well as the state utility ESCOM to which that uh, responsibility ultimately lies. The minerals mining industry in total contributes some 7% to gross domestic products uh, nationally, and employs around 450,000 people. In this, coal is quite significant, uh, even during a period of falling coal prices. Coal was more important to the South African co economy in dollar terms than gold and the platinum group of metals uh, in 2013. In employment terms, the coal industry directly employs more than 82,000 people and the is the third largest mining sector in employment terms after gold and the platinum group of metals. When including downstream activities such as transportation, chiefly rail, uh, the power generation sector, energy transmission, uh, employment in the entire coal supply chain, coal to power and delivery supply chain, rises to some 130,000. Now let's move on to coal-fired power in the electricity sector in South Africa. Uh, but first of all, a little bit of history. Um, in 1994, the apartheid regime was dismantled and South Africa found itself in a new and unprecedented position where the whole nation uh, could be in a state where it could aspire to living in a society with more modern energy services in terms of delivering better health, <clears throat> education, and energy, energy supplies to many more millions of people. The population of South Africa is roughly... Um, 57 million, and uh, almost 70% uh, of that uh, comprises of uh, black Africans, and most of the uh, balance are uh, white Africans, Indians, and others. In terms of electricity supplies, blackouts are common and have been in use in South Africa. 
have been an issue, sorry, in South Africa. And uh, in 2012, the World Bank Enterprise Survey showed that the number one obstacle to business in developing countries was the provision of reliable and consistent electricity supplies. Back in 2005, the South African state utility ESCOM was given the mandate by the government to construct power stations to meet the growing demand for electricity and help promote a much more secure economic development for the region. Around this time, uh, ESCOM had uh, put uh, a couple of proposals through, and a massive 4,800 megawatt Majupi coal-fired power stations was one of those uh, projects. It alone was expected to contribute around 0.35% of GDP growth in South Africa, yet its impact on the local economy was absolutely huge, with potential, uh, potentially boosting the local Lefalali economy by 95% due to the construction of such a large project. By 2007, ESCOM began construction, creating the largest air-cooled supercritical power station in the world and one of the largest coal-fired power stations of any kind in the world. Um, and its sister project at Kazuli mirrored the Majupi in nearly all respects. Critics have raised concerns about the budgets and construction overruns that have occurred, partly due to the technical issues, but these issues have been large, mainly overcome. Uh, in fact, the interest on the outstanding debt that was accrued during the delays of Majupi was um, estimated to account for half of the cost escalations. Funding issues were not helped by the withdrawal of private financial institutions uh, just in the wake of the uh, financial crisis in 2000, between 2006 and 2008, which led to the World Bank stepping in and ensuring that both ESCOM and South Africa got the support it needed for these huge power projects. Despite the cost overruns, by the summer of 2013, the Majupi project embedded itself into the local economy. The labor force reached 18,000 at the peak of construction in, on the Majupi site alone. The local town, Lefalali, saw its GDP boosted, as I mentioned earlier, during the construction of the plants. Um, the project also enabled the training of 53 business owners, the training of 700 technicians in highly in high quality skills and in highly qualified positions in boiler manufacture, coded welding and pipe fitting. 300 local jobs are required just to supply 20,000 meals a day and the site requires more than almost 140 security personnel. Uh, 1.3 billion rand was spent on local Efalali suppliers of goods and services and a further 24,000 jobs are created by the suppliers of those goods and services and the local economy. Now, the economic and employment benefits were just some of the contributions that the mega power projects made to the region. A range of community, education, and health benefits were also felt uh, by uh, the region. Infant and toddler childcare was provided. Children's medial services were improved. Medical services were improved. Uh, primary education and children's nutrition was also improved. Um, community services and adult education training and service sector jobs were also boosted. And uh, almost all of the employment that was created in the services were all supplied by local residents of Efalali. Now let's turn to the value of coal as a provider of grid electricity. In this case, let's move over to North America. Now in this case, during the periods of gas power and gas supplies, um, uh, when they're under severe stress, particularly in the winter time, uh, thermal power generation, including coal, has proven to be a robust and resilient backup. In this US example, this map shows the land surface temperature between the 26th of December in 2017 to the 2nd of January 2018 in the winter of 2017-2018. The blue and white indicates land temperatures ranging zero to more than minus 15 degrees Celsius. And in this period, we can see that a fairly extreme temperature has blighted most of North America. Coupled with high precipitation and low pressures, they created the perfect conditions for incredibly heavy snowfall. And these conditions not only occurred at near record levels, they happened rapidly in a very short period of time as well. Now, in terms of the background to the state of coal power in the USA, um, since 2000, almost 80,000 megawatts, 80, 78 gigawatts of coal capacity has been decommissioned. Almost the same amount, again, of oil and gas has also been shut down in this period. Now, much of this capacity has been replaced with new gas power, and the coal, f although um, the coal fleet has now been reduced to 260 gigawatts, um, 
almost uh, all of the balance in capacity terms has been filled with uh, new gas. But in the USA, bomb cyclones and polar vortices, such as the uh, as shown in the slide, are appearing with considerable severity uh, across much of the USA, and it's also happened uh, in this last winter too. So in these harshest conditions, thermal power generation met an important gap in US energy supplies at a time when the US citizens needed it the most. Coal serves some of, the, some of that purpose, providing 40% of electricity supplies across 13 states in the US East Coast. Oil provided up to 30% of the generation needs, where normally oil provides literally startup fuel, where it might, uh, under normal conditions, provide some 1%. Uh, for the power generation needs for these regions. And nuclear also played a critical role. So consequently, uh, fossil fuel assets, as well as nuclear, uh, may not be completely stranded if such weather events continue to appear regularly in the future. However, a further 130 gigawatts of coal capacity could come offline by 2030 if we were to look at the age of the power stations alone. So the ability of the, for the USA to cope with such weather conditions will need careful planning and forethought in, uh, in forthcoming years. Now, in the forthcoming report that uh, accompanies this webinar uh, that's soon to be issued, um, it's just in preparation for peer review, and the full publication should be available sometime in the early summer. Um, the report actually examines 11 countries, looking at some of the themes that I've discussed uh, in this webinar. Um, it will discuss the themes in varying degrees of detail. The most detailed analysis tends to look at the value of coal producing subregions rather than necessarily looking at entire countries. Or it will look at the value of uh, coal uh, looking at individual power projects. So far I've shown you examples of analysis in Australia, China, the USA and South Africa. Um, we also look at Europe, we look at the value of coal as a source of employment, uh, but also a provider of power and heat in uh, countries such as uh, Poland and uh, regions such as eastern Germany. In India, we examine the value uh, created from new power construction projects. And in smaller emerging economies such as Nigeria and Pakistan, we look at the value of domestic coal and electricity supplies to the economy and the importance of the need for grid power to supplement local renewable distributed generation. Um, coal is also, provided, also provides an often ignored role in the manufacture of energy intensive materials. And this is one of the uh, last themes to be covered in the report. In the case of the cement industry, the manufacture of cement can cut its CO2 footprint massively by using waste created uh, by the ash from coal fired power stations. Uh, from the combustion of coal, uh, further reducing the energy and CO2 embedded in civil engineering materials essential for the uh, construction of, for instance, uh, other energy sources such as hydroelectric power stations, uh, pump storage hydro, and the bases required to, uh, to form the foundations uh, for large utility-scale wind turbines. Um, in addition, wind turbines and almost all civil engineering structures the automotive sector and the food and drink sectors use steel and other energy intensive material, and they use them to varying degrees. Uh, decarbonizing heavy industry without carbon capture, uh, such as the steel sector and cement, is not straightforward. Um, even today, the output from the coal-based blast furnace methods of steel production account for more than 70% of world crude steel output. The electricity-based um, electric arc furnace process accounts for just 25 to 30 percent globally. The blast furnace process has increased its share of world steel production since 2008, from 66 percent to 72 percent in 2017. So, as a result, the share of um, electric arc furnace production, uh, which obviously is uh, less carbon intensive, has actually contracted, and the figures also show this for uh, the European Union as well. Now, in the IEA sustainable development scenario uh, in the World Energy Outlook, by 2040, an additional 2,300,000 megawatts of wind power capacity could be built to push the global wind fleets uh, to more than 2,800 gigawatts. And this expansion of wind turbine capacity in com coming years cannot be achieved really without drawing on large quantities of steel uh, and indeed concrete the metals and the materials that are absolutely uh, essential to these uh, 
uh, new and fast-growing technologies, especially amongst the larger turbine configurations which are emerging in the market today. Thus, the uh, role of coal, uh, in one way or another, will still continue to be an important part, part of the future energy system, uh, in a, even in a minor way as well. So to end, um, here's just a summary, but it's really a short description of the main themes that will be covered in the forthcoming report, most of which I've touched upon in this webinar, but it uh, obviously goes into considerably more detail. Uh, with much more breadth, uh, more countries, and uh, plenty of data. Um, the link between energy and economic growth um, is, well, is really the starting point, uh, particularly in, in industrializing economies. So we look at and introduce the uh, reader to um, some of the macroeconomic terms and some of the trends some of the, uh, and some of the methods that economists use uh, to study the linkage. Uh, between uh, GDP and electricity and energy. Uh, we look at the monetary and employment value created by both mining activities and power generation sectors. Uh, we also have lots of case examples of value created by new construction projects in the wider community. And uh, also, as I just finished off with this in the webinar, uh, the consideration for the use of coal and coal wastes in other industry sectors that are critical to the growth of the rapidly growing uh, renewable energy sector. And so there, I'd say uh, thank you very much for your attention and listening. Uh, I think we now have running at, coming up to just under half an hour, and I think we've still got uh, a bit of time left on the uh, webinar slot to take questions. Um, and I have one here. Okay, the audience participant member is asking, how does the value to the economy of the US coal mining industry compare to that of the shale gas industry? And what kind of effect will the ongoing switch from coal to gas have on overall employment? Um, let me think about that for a moment. Uh, that analysis, um, I, I haven't found um, and I haven't got the data for, I'm afraid, but that is a good question, and I think that's one that's um, possibly worthy of future research. But the second part of the question, what kind of effects will the ongoing switch from coal to gas have on overall employment? I think that would be um, inevitable. Um, the squeeze on employment in North America will be regional. Um, the, perhaps the open cast mines of the uh, American Midwest and the Powder River Basin region, um, they seem to uh, sort of withstand any, uh, you know, most of the um, downward trends and most of the impacts of shale gas on the coal industry has really uh, been felt in the areas in the eastern U.S., uh, in the Appalachian areas, uh, particularly central Appalachian, where they've got a lot more deep mine um, coal mining, uh, more complex geology, more ex much more expensive uh, production. And so I think the f definitely, yeah, employment will be affected, but it will be squeezed more quickly and felt more by perhaps um, the less uh, productive underground mines. Uh, that's the only question. I think I'll maybe I'll hang on. Um, Benedicta, if maybe you could talk about the next webinar, but maybe um, we'll keep an eye on any more questions that pop up while uh, uh, Benedicta covers that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Um, the slides from this webinar will be available to download from the webinar page of our website very soon. And the next webinar from us will be on the 22nd of May. Um, the title will be Modularization of Coal-Fired power, coal power Plants in the 21st Century, presented by <coughs> Dr. Stephen Mills. And it seems like one more question just popped up. I'll pop you back to Paul. Thank you. Um, the question is, what is your forecast for the coal, uh, for coal uh, as a main source of electricity generation towards 2040? Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to 
turn to our um, uh, to the IEA uh, World Energy Outlook for that one. I don't have the number to hand. One thing I do know is that, is that the decline in OECD countries, um, and even then that will be regional, um, will be somewhat compensated by the, uncounterbalanced I should say, by the growth in Southeast Asia. Um, coal demand in China um, will, is, 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 from what I recall from the trends, will level off or decline mainly due to the massive shift in the um, technology advancement in the efficiency. The Chinese technologies of the future, actually now as well as in the future, will use less coal to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity. So that in itself will create a massive efficiency drive the massive boost to renewables and also an increase um, in gas-fired power, of course, will uh, you know, uh, push down any uh, massive growth in the uh, Chinese coal sector. But nonetheless, um, coal will not disappear. It will still produce a massive proportion and many millions of tons of demand for some decades. India is expecting to see a quite a significant increase. Um, despite, in addition to the massive increase in renewable power, um, but the increase in coal demand is um, there. I should say that India and China are also running their coal stations at fairly low loads, um, anything between 50 to 60 percent. So the capacity to increase the utilization and the electricity demand, uh, the coal demand, um, to fill in any gaps is considerable. They've got enough spare, spare capacity to. Um, sustain uh, coal use. Southeast Asia, um, they're moving away from renewables, not moving away from renewables, so that was the wrong thing to say. Um, they were formerly dependent on um, expensive oil-fired power in Indonesia, in Vietnam. They were formerly heavily dependent on hydro and local natural gas. Malaysia, similar to Vietnam, was heavily dependent on local natural gas, extremely cheap pipeline gas. But the way the trends are going, um, I understand that the economics are switching uh, and that now they're having to factor in the cost of not just cheap pipeline gas into power, but LNG gas into power stations. So the economics are changing and swinging in favor of coal. Um, so the fuel of choice to deliver cheap, affordable electricity to the Southeast Asian nations um, is coming from coal, but it's pretty high quality um, power station designs coming from Japan. And, uh, and China as well. So they're importing some, uh, some good quality kits to sustain that. Um, all in all, I think the percentage of coal used, uh, I think, again, you'll have to um, revert to the World Energy Outlook published by the IA Paris and look at their several scenarios. Um, if I could just rewind and go back to the US coal mining industry, I forgot there's the Illinois high sulfur coal industry. And that is, the question was, what's the effect on employment? Um, some of that will also be affected by the ability for the, for the U.S. to export coal as well. Um, even high sulfur U.S. coal is uh, not unattractive to the export market if there's a suitable price discount and where the buyer is fitted with um, the, buyer, the, power, the buyer's power station is fitted with fuel, uh, fuel gas desulfurization to cope with the high sulfur. And if the price is right, it may still be uh, attractive. So again, employment will be affected by a number of factors in North America. Um, I think that is, no, no, we've had no other questions uh, come through, and I've been talking for quite a long time now, so I'll hand over to Benedict to, to um, sign off, and thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, and as we said, the report on this topic will be published in June 2019. Thank you all for joining us today, and goodbye.